Yeah, so, so as mentioned, I'm going to be discussing more use cases here rather than the underlying technology. I think there's some great people here uh, over the next two days that can go into the deeper workings of some of the, this stack. But I want to discuss more of the architectural changes, working on the edge environments, and some of the commercial projects that I've been working with with some major brands in how they're using pragmatic WebAssembly, so not just using it as a gimmick or cutting edge, but actually pragmatically getting benefits from applying WebAssembly in their architecture. Um, to start off with a, a confession, I used to write a lot of Java 2. It seems like there's a lot of us here. Um, but uh, I, uh, I will try not to regress too much into, into those painful times in this talk. OK, so the introduction. The agenda of what, what I'm going to go through today is where WebAssembly works and where it doesn't. Uh, because at the moment, it doesn't work everywhere uh, equally. We, we have to understand where to practically apply it and where not to apply it. Um, common constraints of the full stack web assembly. I'm going to be talking about some edge runtimes or some edge environments with some companies that are here and some companies that are not here, um, and how the limitations on those environments are at the moment, and also where the benefits are of using those edge environments, but also how to self-host edge environments. Um, shifting architectural patterns, so how to change what we currently do with blueprints with cloud environments and on-premise environments, and then how to apply WebAssembly and shift the architecture to a more modern, efficient architecture. Obviously, things like Docker can help with that, but there are other tools as well that I want to go through. Um, what the tooling landscape looks like, I'm not going to provide a full map of the tooling landscape. I want to provide an idea of some of the tools that can be used and where they're at at the moment, and I will be happy to answer some questions of those tools in a deeper way after this talk as well. Um, and then what's next? So I want to go through um, some of the projects I'm working on in the future, which are open source projects. And I'm working with some of the parties here and some other companies as well that aren't here um, using WebAssembly to build new open source tools uh, to solve both sustainability issues and privacy issues for humans. So the first case I'm going to go through is um, a very simple case. It's um, I say simple, but it's not so simple when we go into the details. But it's about building a privacy-first AI solution. So the key requirements we, we got when discussing this with the, with the stakeholders was we wanted to build a mobile application. Now, it says modern web app here because I put my foot in it in the early conversations. They wanted a mobile application. They wanted to do machine learning on a mobile, which is really easy comparatively to the web. Um, and they wanted to ensure that the solution was private by just securing the information on a server. I bravely said, why store it on the server when you can store it on the edge device and never send any information to the server? And also, why use a mobile native app when we can do a web app? Um, that created me a lot of pain in the future, which we will go through. Um, so we developed a solution um, to do machine learning inference in the browser. And this obviously is powered by WebAssembly, which we'll go into in a minute. Uh, we used web services as a progressive enhancement, so the application, the web application had to work entirely offline as a progressive web application, and then it could connect to the web services when it needed to for some additional features. Um, and then it reused models built uh, for the native mobile runtime. So we still had mobile native apps coming in the future, but we wanted to say, hey, you don't need to install a mobile app, you can use a web application and still get the same machine learning capabilities. Um, and again, that, that isn't so straightforward. Um, and then we wanted to retrain the model in the browser. So we didn't want to then send all that data to a server, put it into the, the pipeline for training, and then distribute new models with updates based on the learnings. We wanted to do the learning on each instance of the browser. So when you open the browser and use it, it would learn from your usage and train that model directly and not send your data to the cloud to be aggregated with a traditional data lake. So the key components to building this. Um, we tried to go fully modern with a progressive web app, so we used some shiny tools, but we also used some very familiar tools. Uh, we started with PyTorch in Python for the model development, which is uh, fairly standard. We, we could have used TensorFlow, which we tried, but we had limitations. Um, we used TensorFlow.js for the inference in a browser. Um, we did that by um, converting the model um, after building and optimizing. Uh, we used PySift and PyGrid, which you may not be familiar with, but this allowed us to do federated learning. And federated learning is the ability to run the learning in the browser, aggregate the learnings, not the data, and then send the learnings to the server so it's entirely private. 
Uh, and then we used Google Workbox for caching in the browser. So that meant we could download the models, cache them in the browser for offline use, and then do the inference on those um, and set a policy, essentially, for, for optimizing those caches. And then we used HTML, CSS, and JavaScript because the good tools really do work. So we didn't want to use too many new frameworks. Um, and then for the service stack, we decided we were using WebAssembly for the inference. So we started using Cloudflare, which at the time was one of the more mature edge environments. And I say at the time, we, we have made some sh changes since then. Um, so it was interesting. We wanted to do some reuse on Cloudflare, uh, but also we wanted to ensure that we were distributing the workload efficiently and optimizing the workload on Cloudflare to the best of Cloudflare's architectural promises. So we used modular packages, mostly separating the structure first. So we understood data types, data structures, and we could separate those into separate packages, and then we could run them both on the edge environment in Cloudflare, but also in the browser as well, and have the same kind of data structures mapped. Uh, we determined the shared objects using domain-driven design. So we designed our services as domains, and then we went into the web application and shared those domains in there as well. So we understood the, the pragma pragmatism of um, picking domains first and then separating the code based on that. Um, then we started using uh, web services with the Cloudflare workers, um, which worked really well um, at the time. And then we extended that into our Kubernetes cluster. We use Kubernetes mostly for our training workload, for our distributed federated training workloads. Um, and then we extended Kubernetes for policy management using WebAssembly on Envoy to get that to work effectively. But then it created a seamless integration between Cloudflare and our actual cloud uh, clusters. So the federated training platform, what does it look like? So first of all, we have our custom model executor, which runs in the browser. Um, this, again, runs on um, TensorFlow.js. It's very familiar. I'll go over the stack in a moment. It's optimized to SIMD and GPU running. Um, this is kind of important because we didn't want to run the battery out on a web browser application, and also we didn't want to deploy a massive model onto a mobile phone. On the server, we were looking at 250 megabytes, maybe. We don't want to deploy a 250 megabyte model into a web application. So we had to do some optimizations there. And by using the um, WebAssembly optimized SIMD and GPU optimizations in the browser, um, we could actually, with TensorFlow.js, we could do some optimizations there. And also, we split the way we were processing that audio data, the model being an audio data model. Um, so we did a three, three passes, essentially, with WebAssembly. We did a pass that said, hey, is this actually audio? Is it above a certain volume based on ambient environmental noise? And then the second pass was, is it voice data? Because we want to analyze voice data. Really small model to analyze voice data, so it's super simple. And then the third model is where it gets interesting. Is this a person we want to hear? Is this a person in the room we want to listen to? We don't want to listen to anyone else. We want to discard that data. So that third model is where the execution was really starting to um, use the hardware. Um, but that three pass meant we could optimize what we were processing. We sent the model. Um, to the service gateway once it had been trained on a regular basis, again, when the internet connection was available. Um, we used policy and auth management as a sidecar into that using WebAssembly, so we were pushing to an authentication service as well. Um, and then we used a worker, what we call a domain worker, which is essentially the domain logic of the applications. We would split into different domains, and we would run behind the service gateway so it had no HTTP access. The traffic would then run through the service gateway into the service workers, with zero I.O. And that's because the way Cloudflare works is it imports the WebAssembly uh, workers that you use like they're localized. You don't have to use networking, so they were quite fast. Um, and then we sent that information, that model, to the training grid. Again, no data went up. It was just the learnings from the models that went up. So we're entirely private at this point, and then we aggregate those learnings. So we shift and balance the weights. And that's using PyGrid and PySift. So we still have training data. We have training data because we need data initially to set the baseline for what the model looks like. So we still have training data, but the training data is synthetic. It's not from real people, so we don't need to worry about that. We have PyTorch for our learning mechanism. We ingest the data. We use WebAssembly here to actually do the data transformation. I will show you some of the tooling we use for that later. Um, and then we use Kubeflow on Kubernetes to actually do the training mechanism and the distribution. So the retrospect of what we learned, this is probably the first use case where I've seen WebAssembly used um, pragmatically to solve some real problems in distributing web applications. So 
browsers are great at rendering. We didn't use WebAssembly for any of the rendering pipeline because JavaScript and the DOM and everything else is super good and really powerful and optimized for the hardware the browser is running on. So why try and inject some WebAssembly in there? You're not going to get much benefit. So we ignored that. JavaScript is fast enough. Um, I've hated JavaScript for many years. I'm starting to really appreciate it when it actually does a good job and you don't need to do anything else. So um, we did transpile from TypeScript, but that's because I love types. Um, and apps don't need to send data anywhere. There's a little asterisk there because it sometimes a pro provides some progressive enhancement to the service you're providing, but we really didn't need to send any data. We made a fully private uh, web application that used advanced machine learning in a browser. So that's the first project, and that was a lot of learning there in how to do a full stack WebAssembly application, but also pick the points of where you're going to fight WebAssembly and where you're just going to let other tools take over. The next project is isomorphic analytics. Very similar, we needed to do some machine learning. We needed to build a full stack application. This is maybe two years later. We've done a couple of projects with WebAssembly at this point. So in this case, we wanted to replace a legacy monolithic stack service on a leading um, medical company. Um, they use JavaScript extensions on the server. Um, they were a lot worse than you can imagine. They were running on the JVM on Nashorn. They were seriously out of date. And nobody was maintaining them because nobody knew how to do old JavaScript without all the modern features. And then they used Python, and they even used R. So we had a really, really painful stack to work with. Um, I think the JVM was the version 8, and this was maybe two years ago, this project. So it was really out of date. And they wanted this to run on medical equipment and in the browser and on their service stack, which was a hybrid stack. So it was Microsoft Azure and it was some on-prem hardware as well. And they had unknown connectivity problems because they distributed this to places where they didn't have a great connectivity. They used multi-regional SIM cards and they couldn't always get a connection. So they needed this to work really well offline, but then when it worked online, they got everything they needed from the analytics. So in this particular project, we decided to simplify the way we deployed our services on-prem and we took Fermi and Spin for Spin, um, which worked really well for us. And this was quite early with Spin. I think it was an announcement on Twitter that they were working on it, and a link to GitHub, and then we just tried to see what we could do with it. Um, we used Spin, and we were already using Nomad underneath the Kubernetes clusters at this point, because it was simpler to do Nomad clusters with Kubernetes as just the ingest. Um, and then we built isomorphic analytical functions with WebAssembly. What I mean by isomorphic is we ran the same WebAssembly code on the server that we ran in the browser. Um, and we did this on demand. Uh, and then we extended data processing to an in-process Kafka event queue. So we started using event queues quite a lot at this point, and we wanted to do data transformation. That was really powerful. We didn't want to use Apache Spark or Flink or any of the other Python Java solutions that required Kubernetes setup. We wanted something a little bit simpler. Um, so we did some in-process processing for the data with WebAssembly. And then we extended uh, the Kubernetes clusters in the same way we did before, but we extended them with um, WebAssembly in this case um, to manage critical infrastructure. This was a medical solution. It had to always work. So we wanted to make sure that we could handle some of the load balancing, policy management, and everything else within Kubernetes in a way that was very resilient. So we built our own custom extensions using WebAssembly and on Envoy. Um, so the in-process extensions, uh, I'll go through briefly. We used Red Panda for that. It's quite early days, but it worked quite well for us. So it was Kafka compliant. You can inject your WebAssembly into the event queue. So when something comes through in a, in a data stream, then you can process that data before it leaves your event queue. So when you think about typical Kafka and Apache Spark and Flink, you would pull the data out, process it, and then send it somewhere. We wanted to actually manage this in queue, um, and it was a lot faster doing that. Um, and it was like a serverless delivery platform. Essentially, we'd have a Red Panda queue somewhere, we'd throw the WebAssembly module at it, and it would process it. And we, this would allow our data scientists and data engineers to just keep deploying WebAssembly transformation modules to do whatever they wanted without having to give them a lot of different tooling. We just had to provide a, a lightweight API, essentially, and we built most of that in Rust. Uh, we wanted to reduce the network overhead, so we used sidecar architecture. That means that when the processing came in, um, the WebAssembly um, process runs within the event queue um, as a sidecar, so it listens to the information coming through and then starts processing when it's needed. Um, and then we did high-performance data processing because we used the event queue or Red Panda event queue um, to actually do the scaling. It was essentially a runtime for us at this point for the data scientists. 
Um, and then we use re reusable domain code. So a lot of the code that we use in the event queue, we could also use in the browser and, and the services. Um, and this allowed us to do things like GDPR regulation compliance, CCP, CCPA regulation compliance, because we didn't take any data once it hit the ingest queue and put it anywhere temporarily and then process and clean it and anonymize it. We anonymized it in the queue before it hit any of our actual data centers. And this actually allowed us cost savings, because typically we would go backwards and then clean up the data, which required another process. Um, so as critical infrastructure, Envoy is great. Uh, some of you have probably already used it in Kubernetes. Um, previous to using WebAssembly, it was C++ that uh, a lot of people wrote these extensions in, which even I did. But WebAssembly makes it a lot easier to do that at the moment. Um, and then allows us to do things like common routing. So we applied a singular policy control across all of our clusters. We wrote one module, handled all the policy, so we knew what had permissions to do what in our clusters and where the routing happened. We would optimize between the cloud environment and the edge environment and our cluster um, by doing some clever caching and, and sidecar. Um, and then we would support closer integrations with hybrid environments, um, again, using the edge environment and, and the on-prem clusters. And the API routing, so all the services, we had a common API routing. We knew which one was a billing service, which one was a diagnostic service. We could split each of those domains create a common routing library and then deploy that into Envoy as well. And also it was the same library we were using in the services themselves. So a lot of reusable code. Um, and then we would have more control over critical infrastructure. The, again, this had to always work. This was a national service, so we didn't want this to go down at any point because um, it could cost lives. Um, so the target architecture, we have our web application, again, very familiar now. We have our service cluster gateway, um, which is running in the edge environment. Um, and then connects to our uh, Kubernetes cluster. And then we have our HTTP services. Our new ones were all built with uh, Spin. Um, we had Redis on there and Postgres later, uh, which worked really well um, because it's provided by Spin. And then we um, had our analytical models connected to our web application. So we could do the normalizing, the statistical modeling on demand. So if somebody knew they needed to do diagnostics on a heart murmur, for example, they could download the model, run it, not um, explicitly, it would automatically download once they entered that feature. And then when they went offline, they could continue to do that modeling and that assessment. And then when the results came in and the connection was available, it could send that data back up. But it was the same model we were using on the server to do the same diagnostics. Again, we have the Red Panda event queue to do the data processing as it comes up through the web application. And then we have our domain worker in the back doing the actual heavy lifting for the applications we have. And th these are split. We're not, it's not a single domain worker. We have distributed domain workers. But they're using the same analytical models. And the reason we have two here is because somebody can fake the information coming from the browser that the model says, oh, I've detected a arrhythmia in a heart. But we wanted to make sure that that data, once it came to the server, was revalidated. And it used exactly the same code in WebAssembly to make sure that that data was, was integral. And the next use case is automotive. So we've been working with uh, Polestar, who wanted to do a um, decentralized Web3 project. Um, I'm not going to take questions on Web3 in this conversation. Um, but they wanted to build an open ecosystem. The actual use case was super interesting. So they said, hey, we don't want to work with various partners. We don't even want to worry about our um, competitors, we want to build an open ecosystem where we can have a feature in the car, somebody can provide a service for cars, they can integrate without us having to actually have a conversation. Um, so the data is always private. It was, it's key to me to build systems where data is private. So we made sure the data was private in this case. Um, but it was actionable by all. So we used the blockchain as an event system, which is super interesting. We use smart contracts for this. Again, I'm not going to discuss the validity of smart contracts in this. But, but they worked quite well for this project. Um, the focus was on ecosystems. They didn't want to build a product or platform. They wanted to build an open ecosystem where anybody in the industry could operate. Um, they wanted highly computer, computational workloads to run uh, because we needed cryptography. We needed zero knowledge proofs throughout the system to validate information without actually having the information itself. So zero knowledge proofs for anybody that's not familiar. We would send a proof to say we're claiming maybe a vehicle has done 10,000 to 20,000 kilometers. It's a range proof. We would need then the system to say, yes, this is valid. This car has done this, this, this much mileage. So we could validate information that the car, and I mean the car, was claiming it was true. Um, and then logic and structure reuse is critical. This is a small project. We have like three people in the development team. 
uh, yeah, three people on the service stack and the development team, and then one mobile developer. So it, it was super in, uh, important to make sure we were reusing components here. Um, and introducing uh, Rust and WebAssembly caused a few very serious discussions with that development team. Um, so we used smart contracts as extensions. Uh, they ran in the blockchain uh, with WebAssembly built with a Rust SDK. We used something con co called Concordium as a blockchain, um, which was mandated by, by Polestar, but it works really well. Um, every contract is public and verifiable in this blockchain, so you're releasing code that everybody can see. It's not open source, but everybody can see your code on the blockchain, and they can see what, what you're essentially doing um, and interact as well. Contracts can never be updated or deleted. There's a little bit of an asterisk here, because you can update or delete these contracts, but they're not really updated or deleted. They're just replaced with another one, and the old ones still are there, just not actionable. Um, but again, you have to rethink your deployment model. Uh, authorization and role-based access control was actually done by delegation, so we still needed things that weren't running on the cluster, so we built some services um, in Rust where we could do the authentication using uh, crypt crypto IDs. And then testing was far more complicated because it's really hard to test code in an environment that is public and everybody can see it. You don't want to deploy something with your name on it and then find out it's doing something really stupid. So you have to find a way of really doing unit testing with smart contracts, which is difficult. And then accidents are far more damaging with this environment. So we really had a deployment problem. How do we deploy something and make sure it's really good code um, without causing some problems? Um, so the target architecture for this, we had two wallets. The vehicle has its own wallet here. Everybody has a wallet, a driver has a wallet. They, they are spending stuff with their crypto. Um, not crypto tokens, uh, but they're spending stuff with their um, crypto rewards, uh, their subscriptions and such. But we have a vehicle wallet as well, so the vehicle can pay for its own stuff. It can be paid for things as well, so it's autonomous, not in self-driving, but it can actually do its own things, its own shopping if it could actually pick up the, the grocery bags. Um, and then they both share contracts, so we're building contracts with WebAssembly. Concordium supports this with the Rust SDK. It supports other languages as well. Um, um, but it's built on Rust. And then we shared these contracts between the mobile wallet and the vehicle wallet. And these two talked to each other in a peer-to-peer. -peer. So they didn't need to go to the blockchain. The blockchain was used for the eventing only. Um, and then Concordium nodes operate anywhere, and, and anybody can run their own node. They would use the same contracts. And these contracts would say things like, um, hey, this car wants to charge. It's plugged into a charging point. D is anybody using this network that can provide charging on this charging point? Um, and then it would talk with the wallet, it would start the charging process with a smart contract, and then it would take the money from the car with a smart contract once it had finished charging. And the car could say things like, I only want to be charged to 80% today. Um, and then third-party services. So when we're talking about the charging point operators, the aggregators on electric vehicles, these could integrate with the Concordium network um, by integrating with these smart contracts and say, I want to provide charging services to this. I want to hear on the network, on the chain, when an event comes up that operates in one of my charging points. And again, this is all WebAssembly extensions essentially running entirely through this network. On the vehicle wallet as well, we, um, we built uh, on the WebAssembly runtime. So we tried to run the, the WebAssembly component on that runtime. Um, so we used Fastly for this. We, we'd moved from our, our previous mentioned Edge Cloud provider, and we started using Fastly. Um, and again, I can talk to anybody today about why that was, but I won't cover this in this talk. Um, but we, were, we ran about three projects at the same time, so it was a great learning experience to try and learn everything across three different projects. Um, it was easy, easiest to build on. I say easiest because there's a learning curve on the terminology. And Fastly used something called Varnish, which uh, I haven't used in a long, long time, and we had to get the development team to get up and running with that. But pretty much, it went up and running fairly painlessly um, with the SDK. So we used, again, Rust for the WebAssembly Edge environment on Fastly. It was performed with zero maintenance, and I mean zero maintenance. We deployed something with our CI, and then we never looked at it again. It just worked. And, and because Fastly does versioning, we could just see what was happening when a new version was deployed and it broke. Um, and we could figure out what was happening with the logging on that as well. Um, there was no real database or storage. There is a dictionary, but there's no real database or storage if you want to build a highly scalable database on Fastly at the moment. So we had a problem there. We had to solve that. Other companies, edge companies, had their databases. Um, but it wasn't that painful to solve. Um, and the HTTP interface needed to be customized for our use case. It doesn't normally work really well, but we had to do something really clever where we wanted to run 
um, HTTP services on multiple uh, formations of hardware as well as in Fastly, so, and we didn't want to write duplicate code, so we wrote a bridging component to bridge Fastly's HTTP interface and our own. We wanted to use the open source library from Fastly in Rust, but there wasn't one, so I, I think that's coming from what I've heard. Um, so data on the edge was surprisingly difficult to get right when they don't have a database. So most environments, like any real database solution, in, with WebAssembly in a browser on the edge, you, you want to be able to do that. You don't have the TCP access, so how do you do that, that uh, processing with databases? Um, and also ambiguous with regulations. So um, other companies can claim that they are GDPR compliant, but the problem is you don't know where that data has been processed or stored in most cases. Um, so we had a bit of an issue there when using other providers. So in this case, we, we were quite happy to go regional and make sure we were compliant with our data storage. Um, securing edge databases is very difficult because you want to make sure that the traffic is secured. Usually I would use mutual TLS and other forms of encryption, but some edge databases, they, they really do lack options there. Um, and then supporting databases is obviously difficult. So we use Terminus DB to begin with. As an open API you can use over HTTP, you can send your queries and get the responses back and then uh, change them. It, it doesn't have a WebAssembly driver, so we built our own, um, but it does have a JavaScript driver and I think a Python driver, which work really well. So it's, a, it's essentially a knowledge graph database, quite powerful. Um, super recommend experimenting with it and seeing what you can do with it. And it works really well in a distributed fashion. And then more recently, towards the end of this project, we started applying Surreal DB. Uh, which is fairly new. SurrealDB does have a WebAssembly driver, which works really well. We got up and running in less than a day, but deployed our database on Nomad on a cluster somewhere, and then connected with our Fastly workers straight into our SurrealDB. So what am I doing next after all these experiments? So we're building something called Namio now. And Namio is a human cloud environment. It's designed not for organizations to run their workloads, but for people to run their workloads. People that don't have any technical experience, um, but they do want to control the data um, and uh, the applications they're using. So we're building it on the SOLID project, which we've been experimenting with for years. And when I say we, it's a nonprofit foundation we're doing at the moment in, in the Nordics. Um, and we're part of the Fastly Fast Forward program at the moment, uh, building this on uh, Fastly's infrastructure, but also it has to run on premise. So our target environment is can somebody run it on a low powered Raspberry Pi at home? Uh, with very little technical knowledge. Um, so this is about personal data storage, personal functionality. Can you store your address book on this? Can you store your email on this? Can you store your social media on this? Um, so it's a distributed cloud project designed for everybody, um, and it's entirely WebAssembly based. It's entirely open sourced. Um, we're working on open sourcing more pieces at the moment. Um, it's all about distributed data spaces, so you can store your data anywhere. So if your health company or your insurance company has some of your data, they can operate part of this um, on their environment, and then you can operate a different part, and you can operate the trust model between those two different areas. Um, it supports ActivityPub and the Fediverse, because, hey, we might as well support everything open. And then it's designed to be convenient and simple. So we have a real zero technical approach here. We want a single-click approach. My target is, can my mother deploy this at home on a very old Mac? Um, and my mother is a great benchmark for testing technology. Um, and it supports privacy-preserving AI, because the problem we have at the moment is everybody's getting benefits from AI tools with all their, their uh, email and everything else. We wanted to provide that convenience to everybody else without saying you have to give up your data for that convenience. So you can dump, use privacy-preserving AI with federated learning in this environment with WebAssembly to make sure that anybody can deploy a WebAssembly module, do some federated learning, and provide you with some um, anticipatory recommendations. Um, and then it's fully extensible with WebAssembly modules. So we have a three-tier stack, which I will go through very quickly um, because I'm running out of time with, with this. So it's based on decentralized knowledge graphs. We have our web identity, which is a web standard. Uh, we have a web access control, so you can define who can access your data, when can they access it. Um, and then we have, for example, cloud medical data somewhere with a medical practitioner. That could be stored somewhere, but it's behind your web access control, so you control that and define that. And then your local social data could be locally on your Raspberry Pi, but it's part of your same singular knowledge graph that you fully control, rather than a company controlling that, where you can provide access on demand within certain rules of who can use that. And then we have third-party apps that come on that environment. 
So we redid uh, data mesh architecture to get this to work, and I'm really going to rush through this uh, now because I think the, the diagram is more interesting than the text. But data lakes are kind of old-fashioned. Aggregate data, store it, and then do something on it later, maybe, but now we have everyone's data. We didn't want to build that. We wanted people to own their own isolated data in this case. So we have a HTTP REST interface. We have a core service runtime, which is a WebAssembly-powered runtime written in Rust. It runs WebAssembly modules. So we have a base runtime for our ing ingress into our data mesh. And then all of our data processing and endpoint registrations happens within WebAssembly modules. So once you deploy this, you can in install as many modules as you want to do what you need. We have our event queues. These are Kafka compliant. We can support others, which I'll show you how to in a moment. Um, and we support gRPC as well. So if somebody wants more control over their code, they can run gRPC, which would then integrate into the WebAssembly modules. And then we have our domain worker runtime, which does most of our heavy lifting again. And we do this through cloud events. So cloud events go throughout the entire system. We have a, a documentation of what the JSON schema is for those, but this allows extensions through the event queue as well. So people can build their own extensions to subscribe to events in the queue. And then in the back end, we also have WebAssembly modules for those extensions. So you can do some logic behind the scenes to manage different data storage solutions and such. So this is a web service architecture, not a data mesh architecture, which is what I've just claimed it is. Um, but what if we took about away the interface? Then we're essentially we have an event queue and we have our domain processing. But what if we decide that we want to support a different event queue? So we use gRPC. Uh, same runtime, same SDK we now ex uh, extend to support a different event queue, uses the same WebAssembly uh, modules we've already written. We don't want to have to rewrite these. Now we've introduced a new component into the stack. Um, so the SDK allows us to use the same ones. Um, and then for any ingress that we need to do from other data, we can just connect into their runtime and pull that data in and then process it again in process on the event queue and make sure that data is processed, transformed, and is not storing anything we shouldn't be storing before it goes into our data stores. If you wanted to add a different data store, and this is the interesting thing about spin adding, for, for example, Postgres support. If you wanted to add something different, we do something very similar. We would deploy a new domain worker runtime, which adds support for a different data store, but it would run, again, the same WebAssembly modules that would now write, write to a different data store seamlessly. So the extensibility model for this, and this is our, the final part, we have our cloud events. So you do event-driven architecture. You subscribe to the events, pull in the information, process that information in queue. Um, anybody can build something to subscribe to that event queue, so it's fully extensible. gRPC provides a more technical and more powerful way of doing extensions, because now you can distribute your workloads across different environments for one different solution and use gRPC to do some really interesting things that has access to the hardware if needed. But then we do WebAssembly. There should be the 90% of extensions uh, with WebAssembly running uh, multilingual uh, plugins that are lightweight that run on those gRPC nodes. And then finally, combining all three is our holistic solution to extensibility uh, for building services in the future. And we're doing this across multiple commercial projects with companies as well, where we're giving them the tooling to build a stack um, using most of the tools that you guys are familiar with. And then they're just building extensions in their organizations, not building the core boilerplate for building services instead, which they shouldn't be doing anyway. And then I'm going to skip through this. This is essentially we're building an authentication service on Namio that is fully open source, fully powered by WebAssembly. So if you want to add a different capability, you do a WebAssembly module. So OAuth2, OIDC, WebID, they're all WebAssembly modules in this. And if you want to support something new, you can just do that. And it fully works on fastest edge compute at the moment. So it's pluggable, but it also runs on your Raspberry Pi at home. And you can actually bridge the two. So you can say, hey, if uh, my Pi goes down, I want to use fastest compute. If my Pi is available, use that. So I have a synchronization of my personal data if anything happens. So thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much. Um, really good presentation, and it was also really good to see a machine learning workflow presented in WASM. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your model training cycle. Yeah, so the model training cycle looks so, super simple there, but it's really not. So we use Kubeflow, which is obviously very familiar for doing this. 
We used uh, TensorFlow Extended to begin with, so we did our training, uh, our data ingest, our processing, our, our validation, and then we would go through a training mechanism and validating the model, so we wouldn't test against that. The way I don't want to go too much into this, but the way I, I do my model development is like good software development. A lot of data scientists don't know good software development because they were trained as data scientists. But we did unit testing and integration testing and all the things you don't get with models typically. And then we would do the validation on that model, so the validation on the output with our own synthetic data. And that's where the complication is. Is your synthetic data realistic enough to make the model valid? Or are you synthesizing something and breaking your model essentially? So we had to really work on that, and that was part of our data validation. We would generate data, and then we would validate the data's assumptions. And then the process would be circular. So we would continue that process and make sure that the model is, is always updating itself. Once a month, we would release a new model, even if the data hadn't changed. Um, and we wanted to make sure we were efficient with the e ecolo ecology of that. So we would make sure we were running it in the optimal time not to use mi bad mixed energy in Europe, for example. Um, but then when the, date, when the weights came up and the process came up where the people were using the application and shifting the models up back into the cloud environment and we needed to rebalance those weights into the models and retrain based on the weights, not the data, then we would have to aggregate all of the models into a single, we say data lake, but there's no data, there's just the models. And then we would process the learning cycle manually at that point. I say manually, there wasn't a human involved, but we would trigger it based on events and say, we're now going to take all these models and we want to rebalance all of these in the grid system and then redeploy all the models back down into the browser, into people's devices when they have a connection again. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I want to ask, uh, when you develop these modules, WebAssembly modules, uh, so you probably needed uh, some external libraries uh, to use, and uh, is it, uh, was it uh, compatible, like, uh, since uh, they may not be ported to Was WASM, right? No, we had a lot of pains. My, de my development team hated me at times because I kept introducing tools that they weren't familiar with. So we used different versions of WASM runtimes, for example, because we were trying to solve different problems. In the car, we used uh, WASM, for example, I think. Um, but in most other areas, we were using WASM time. Um, and then we were using Rust throughout. So we used Golang. So we, were, we didn't decide to go, go, go against Golang, but that was for infrastructure. We used Rust for our core tooling. Um, and that created a lot of problems because the maturity of some of those components wasn't as good as it would have been if we used Go or if we'd used a different WASM runtime. So we had a lot of, I would say it wasn't smooth, smooth sailing of implementing all the tools and getting everything to work correctly and a lot of experimentation. Experiments including the Surreal DB, which we only did recently um, because we were having real problems with supporting other databases securely for, for Polestar. So therefore, we had to experiment with a new database. And again, it was easy, but it was finding a database that would provide what we needed that would run on an edge time environment or at least be accessible from an edge environment. Um, so I would say none of this was, was straightforward. But again, it benefits from most of the work people are doing in this room, which when I first started with WebAssembly years ago, everything was a lot more painful. <laughs> so we're in, a, we're in a great state right now to actually be doing this pragmatically without costing people money or time trying to get things to work too, too far. And one uh, final thing about this gRPC approach. I mean, uh, did you find uh, inefficiency you know, in terms of performance? Did, did you find it performant enough? When you, uh, yeah, it was, it was super, super powerful, the gRPC connections. And we could do it from the browser as well. So gRPC, the way we loaded it, and we did some load balance, some, I would say, clever load balancing, but I didn't build it. So uh, we did some clever load balancing on the gRPC traffic. Um, and we didn't have really any problems with that gRPC load. And the gRPC just didn't work over the network either. We did gRPC locally. So in the same way that tools like Terraform work, we wanted to be able to deploy plugins locally, and we used gRPC on a local machine to do that because we didn't want to use too many low-level concepts on each different environment, each different platform, just to get some uh, remote invocation to work from different modules. Thank you. OK. Thank you.